All right. I mean, y'all can sing. That's pretty impressive, man. If you can come out swinging in the first couple songs, y'all give it up for the band. Thank them for leading us. I was always jealous, man. I wish I could play guitar. <laughs> All right, y'all. We're going to be in Daniel chapter one tonight. Uh, my name is Lane. I am a pastor on staff at First Baptist Church in Marble Falls, Texas. Anybody know where Marble Falls is? Yeah, the chosen few of you. It's, uh, it's about an hour west of Austin. It's a small town out there. I've been there for a few years. Um, it's worth knowing me only because I will be telling stories all weekend. Um, and the characters of my stories are normally people like my wife, Haley. Um, I also have two daughters. I have a four-year-old named Emery and a one-and-a-half-year-old named Nora. And they are like all things princesses and crazy. Uh, and so my life is nothing but just an ongoing musical of like Frozen and Encanto and Moana. It, it's insane. Um, we've been there for six years. I grew up in Georgetown, Texas, just a little bit south of here. Um, and so we'll tell some stories from there as well. Went to Texas A&M um, for school. I know that always divides the room. Listen, it doesn't matter who you love or where you go to school. Jesus loves you too. Like that's, it is what it is. Uh, and I'm, I'm also going to school at Truett right now, so like Baylor people can be happy there. We can all be one big family in the Lord, all right? Before we dive into Daniel chapter one, here's the deal. Uh, you may not have spent like a whole ton of time in the book of Daniel. Um, your knowledge of some of the stories from Daniel may even be from like Veggie Tales uh, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or uh, Rakshak and Benny, as I affectionately call them. And we'll be looking a little bit at their story as well as we go through the weekend. We're going to be in the book of Daniel every single time that we step into this room, um, looking through these chapters and seeing what does it mean for us. But here's the deal. Anytime we come into a room like this, I understand that not everybody knows what the Bible is. Not everybody understands what it is that they're holding. Um, and so some of us, like maybe your friend invited you uh, and you like go to church Christmas and Easter and you don't like you just know like the Jesus passages maybe and where to get there quickly. Um, you maybe know Proverbs, like the old trick where they're like, if you just open up about halfway, you'll find your way somewhere in like Psalms, Proverbs in that area of the Bible. And so before we dive in, I'm gonna give you a crash course in your Bible. Cool, a little Bible 101, all right? So in the Bible, we believe that it is the written revelation of God. It is written into two parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is about two thirds or three fifths um, of your Bible. It begins at creation. God creates everything and he creates it to be good and then man ruins it. Uh, man puts themselves at the center of the story thinking that they can be God and sin enters into the scene. Now, sin is just a word that we use at church and Christianity and all these things um, that really just defines the broken relationship between us and God, us and each other, and us and the created order. It's that deep-seated feeling that you get that things just are not how they should be. And so in sin, everything breaks, and yet God loves people and wants to be with his people. And so he forms for himself a people called the nation of Israel and begins to make them his people, and they're supposed to be an example of what it means to be the people of God all throughout the Old Testament to all of the surrounding nations. And it turns out that the Israelites are terrible at being the people of God. They get it wrong over and over and over and over and over again. They prove to be an unfaithful and disobedient people, and what the nation of Israel finds out is that they need a rescuer, a savior, or what scripture is going to call the Messiah. Now, they think that that rescuer, savior, Messiah is going to be like a political hero or a king of a nation, like the kings that they knew, often referencing maybe like a King David type person. Um, or even a war hero. And yet, when we enter into the New Testament, we see this Messiah come onto the scene. God sends himself in Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. And Jesus begins preaching about this thing called the kingdom of heaven. And so he's not a king of like a nation that we know it. He's a king of something called the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. As a matter of fact, he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he doesn't just preach about this kingdom. He also uh, begins to live out what this kingdom looks like. And so everywhere that Jesus goes, he's saying things like, hey, the kingdom of heaven is like this. 
and then he does that thing. That's where we see him um, healing sick. That's where we see him coming into controversy with Pharisees. That's where we see him talking about great generosity. That's where we see him speaking to powers above him in places of oppression. That's where we see all these moments. And everywhere that Jesus goes, it feels like little pockets of the kingdom of heaven pop up around him. And people begin to kind of come, become infatuated with the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. They begin to wonder what it might be like to live in and be in that kingdom. And Jesus is so good. He doesn't just preach about a kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God and live out what that looks like. He then makes a way for people to join him in that kingdom. As a matter of fact, he says that he is the way, the truth, the life, and that no one is going to come to the Father except through him. The way that he does that, through the death and resurrection of Jesus, through his death and resurrection. It's a weird way to make a way into a kingdom, but it is the way. It looks like a government execution, but we know it to be a sacrifice to invite people into right relationship with God. And then the rest of the New Testament is seeing this first century church, these early followers and disciples who have entered into this kingdom of heaven by giving their lives over to Jesus, being forgiven of sin and now living in a new way, awaiting for God to make it right again. That is what is in scripture. That is the story from front to back of the narrative that we are gonna step in. And we are gonna step into an Old Testament moment in the book of Daniel, uh, in this moment where they are still trying to live the way of God, even if in a land that does not want them to. And so as we study that this weekend, we're gonna look at and think, at what, think about what does it mean to live in a land that does not want us to follow God, whether maliciously or explicitly or subtly, we're gonna look at what it means to live in that land. Cool? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for tonight. God, we're thank you, thankful for the book of Daniel. God, we're thankful uh, that we learn something from these stories, that they encourage us and they move us forward, and they give us an example of how to be your people. And Father, tonight, uh, we just proclaim together that we love you and we trust you, and it's in your name we pray, amen. Well, sometimes when we step into scripture, there are like some definitions that we need to know, um, some words that we're gonna use, and that we wanna just be on an agreed upon understanding of those things, okay? And so there are really two major words that we're gonna use kind of back and forth all throughout the weekend. The first one is Babylon. Now, Babylon in this text is an actual uh, nation that we're going to reference. Like they have a geographical location, they have a people, they have a king, they have all these things. But we're gonna kind of simultaneously refer to Babylon often as our culture as well. Scripture actually does this all throughout. It begins to talk about Babylon as the place that they live, but not the place that they belong. See, Babylon has a different um, idea of what should be. Babylon cares about things like success, status, power, authority, money, and getting everything at all costs and sacrificing everything along the way. And that can begin as we kind of spell it out this weekend to look like the culture outside of these walls. That's the culture that we live in. That's the culture that we go to school in. That's the culture that we're growing up in. And so oftentimes we will refer to our culture also as Babylon. Now, the flip side of that is as a believer, if you are a follower of Jesus, there are gonna be moments that you feel like, right, when you're in school or in your house or wherever you are, that you feel like you do not belong where you live because you wanna do things a certain way that hopefully align with God, but then everything around you feels like it's fighting against you. And that feeling that you have is the feeling of an exile. All right, so exile is a theme throughout scripture. We see it over and over again. We see the people kind of exiled, uh, the nation of Israel exiled a couple times in the Old Testament. Even if you're familiar, um, well, like the story of the Exodus um, and even Joshua and they're in the wilderness roaming. They're even exiled really before they even get to the promised land. And it's just this feeling that you are living in a place that you do not belong. That's what exile is. And so we're gonna talk about that feeling and address that because that is where our people, that's where our characters are in the text. That's where Daniel and his buddies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which we're gonna find out aren't even their real names, that's where they live. They live in exile. They live in the land of Babylon, even though they don't really belong there. And even though they wanna do something different, even though they wanna do things a different way. And we're gonna see, well, how is it then that they live in those places? Okay, so there's this, there's this thing that happens to us when we end up in a place that we've never been before. And that isn't like us, 
and that doesn't feel like us and doesn't feel like our culture and doesn't feel like home, and it's this incredible feeling of loneliness that we get when we step into those. So as Waco and the surrounding areas are blowing up all the time and people are moving here like crazy, and if you've ever moved to another school or maybe like you just moved into the Waco area in the last couple of years, there is this feeling that you get, right, that first time that you walk into school and you're like, nobody here knows me, nobody knows where I'm from, nobody knows what I'm like, no one knows the things that I like, and if they find out, they're gonna think I'm really weird. Right, statistically, my generation as a millennial, we like begin the, begin the trend toward loneliness, and then your generation steps in and it's like, everybody feels lonely all the time. Which is crazy because you have like the most friends digitally than like anyone has ever had. Like more people can see you and the things that you do and see me and the things that I do than any other time in human history. And yet, statistically, we all feel the, lonely, the loneliest. And so we know that feeling, we resonate with that feeling. Now what happens when you take that loneliness and then you put it into a place that you don't feel like you belong is you begin to try and figure out how to belong because you want a thing called community or friends, or to be known, which by the way, are really good things, right? In Genesis chapter one, God talks to Adam and sees all of creation and he goes, man, it's really not good for man to be alone. That is not just a statement that applies to like marriage, that is a statement that just applies generally. It's just not good for us to be alone. We are better together, like we are better in connection. So that feeling that you have is right. There's no better way to figure out this feeling if you were to go uh, over to Baylor and you were to walk on campus like two weeks after class starts, you were gonna find the most incredible social experiment you've ever found in your entire life. Okay, so when I went to college, here's what happens. You take like a few hundred or a few thousand 18 year olds, some of which have lived in town and the town that they lived for like years, years and years and years. They have a whole life back in that town. They have family, they have friends that they grew up with, they have stories. Maybe they've got championships that they won or like nothing that they ever won. (laughs) Back home, like they have a whole narrative to them and then they step into this new location where nobody knows them. And then about two weeks later, and it's usually girls that are this way, so sorry girls, but dudes are this way too. But about two weeks later, you will start finding people walking with one another, like everyone, they're like walking to class, blah, 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 and there'll be these girls like walking next to each other, laughing, they're like, oh my gosh, this is Susan, and Susan's like my best friend, and it's just like, we're, we just belong together, we know each other, we should, we should be together forever. It's insanity. And you're like, you don't even know Susan's middle name. And she's like, it's like, well, she just gets me, she gets me. You're like, you stayed up late one night eating a pancake supper, and now you would go to war for that person. Like, it's like, no. In two weeks, like you're so desperate for connection. You're so desperate for community. You're so desperate for these things. You're like, I'll take like whatever version of friendship I can get. Thank you, Susan, (laughs) right? Dudes is like totally different. Like they're just like, like they can walk by a guy on campus like, what's up bro, what's up bro? And then they'll graduate with that bro and they'll just be like their best friend forever. Like I'll put you in my wedding. (laughs) But it's it's that loneliness, right? That makes us, we walk into these spaces, we go, how can I make friends? What do I need to do? Now what happens is sometimes that can be really healthy. Sometimes that can push you out of your comfort zone, right? It can push you past the anxiety and past the fear to like get out of your room and go meet new people, to go do a new thing, to talk to that person that sits next to you in class that you've never talked to before. Like some of that compelling for a relationship can push you into those spaces. But what it can also do is it can take even 18 years of identity shaping, and it can totally obliterate it in 18 days. Because you and I are are really prone uh, when we step into these spaces that if we can't find relationship and community quickly, and if we can't find acceptance quickly, and if we're in a new space long enough, which really isn't that long, we will just begin to believe that everything that is true about that place is true about us, and that the first people that we can find connection with, we will start making what is true of them also true about us, and then we come home for Christmas, right? Or we've moved to this new place, we come home one day, and your parents are like, hey, um, you, you're different. I'm like, not in a good way. Like your, total, your whole identity is shift, shifted, okay? I was in third grade, Uh, When this first happened to me, I moved uh, to Georgetown, Texas from Northwest Arkansas when I was like four years old. 
And so I grew up my whole life in Georgetown. But what happened is when my dad was working, whenever he would get better jobs, we would move into different parts of Georgetown. And so in third grade, that was the first time that we moved where I had to change schools when I was living there. Now, being born in Arkansas and my whole family living in Arkansas, I grew up a diehard Arkansas Razorback fan. And I'm like, I had red walls. I had like a hog snout, like all those weirdos. Like I had all of this different stuff, hardcore. But I lived in Georgetown, about 30 minutes north of Austin, Texas. And so in third grade, when I walked into my class and there was all these other dudes in my class, like they were all little third grade Texas fans. Like they loved UT. And I was this weirdo from Arkansas that was like, let me tell you about the Arkansas Razorbacks. It's like a pig, but more intimidating. And it was like, I was like, man, this, it was just not gonna work. Like no one wants to be friends with that kid. And so I remember I came home one day in third grade and I was like, I think, uh, Dad, I'm a Texas Longhorn fan. It was like the worst news he's ever found out in his entire life. I was like, I let down my entire, there were dead people in my family that were coming out of the grave. Like they were like, just get rid of him. I mean, it was hardcore. And I remember like that first Christmas, I got these like, man, we don't wear these anymore, which is a total bummer. I got like these long pants, like the buttons all down the side that were just br like, bright burnt orange with a Texas Longhorn on it. And I like this faux like Walmart UT football jersey and I wore it like all the time. It took all of like 30 seconds to take like an entire family thing, what I did on Saturdays, love that I have for a team, blah, 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 to walk into one classroom in third grade and some homeboy was like, no, we're, we're Longhorn fans. And I was like, I guess I am too. Like that was the only way to figure it out. And we talk about that because when we step into, when we start talking about Babylon, all of those feelings in those moments, now like multiply that times a hundred and that's what it feels like if you're trying to walk with Jesus or do the, like, do the way of the things of the Lord in your schools and in your cities and in your culture. Like if you really wanna to try to follow Jesus and give your life to Jesus, it gets incredibly complicated really, really quickly because culture does not walk hand in hand with that. And so we have to look at Daniel and go, hey, how does he handle it so we can figure out how we can handle it? And in chapter one, we step into Daniel's captivity, um, and we're gonna see really what happens to the nation of Israel, that Babylon takes them, and what this means for Daniel and his buddies. And so in chapter one, verse one, it says this, and y'all are gonna get to hear me like obliterate a bunch of Old Testament names, so this will be fun for everybody. In the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and laid siege to it. Time out real quick. Uh, if you play football or you're like an athlete in this room, um, anytime you just like obliterate another team, tell them that you laid siege to them because that is way cooler than just beating somebody. That's just a side note. I love that. Verse two. The Lord handed King Joachim of Judah over to him along with some of the vessels from the house of God and Nebuchadnezzar carried them to the land of Babylon to the house of his God and put the vessels in the treasury of his God. And then the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the Israelites from the royal family and from the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, good looking, suitable for instruction in all wisdom, knowledgeable, perceptive, and capable of serving in the king's palace. Have you ever met somebody that like plays varsity football and they're also in the top five in your class and you just hate that dude? Because it looks like the Lord gave to him in abundance. Like, that this, is, this guy's got like a whole king's court of them. Like this is just varsity athlete geniuses is what this guy's going on. No physical defect? Do you know how many physical defects I have? I'm 6'2", 145. I'm a walking physical defect. This dude's got a ton, like none of them. This says this, he was to teach them the Chaldean language and literature. And then the king assigned them daily provisions from the royal food and from the wine that he drank. And they were to be trained for three years. And at the end of that time, they were to attend to the king. Among them from the Judites were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, or, Azariah, or as you might know them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When we see this moment, what we see is that the, the, the 
the king of Nebuchadnezzar goes in, lays siege, conquers an entire place. Lord gives the nation of Israel for, to them. He takes their king and then he takes their best dudes and brings them over into his palace and is going to make them his. And they're going to enter into a three year long boot camp. They're about to go through training in the whole span that middle school is. Like sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Like you think middle school is long. These dudes are about to go through it 10 times over. And they takes the best people and he's gonna give them the strict like food diet. Now we're gonna get into some things here and we're gonna start talking about like this food here and this food there. Here's what this passage is not. It is not like a dietary restriction chart. It's not like, and here's how the people of God eat. This passage is about so much more than food and drink. But what you'll notice is the very first thing that Nebuchadnezzar does is he changes their names. He changes their names because the quickest way to make somebody believe something about themselves is to give them a whole new identity. You actually know this, right? Because you speak a, a language in the teenage world, right? Like you may call someone names of variety of colorful language or Gen Z slang, whatever you come up with. And you can be called that or call someone that enough that they will like really begin to believe that about themselves. Like they can see themselves in the image with which you have created for them with their words. And so the like, smartest thing really that King Nebuchadnezzar can do to move the nation of Israel into being his people and his way of life is the very first thing is to change their names because it will change their whole identity. And the hope is that they'll begin to believe about themselves like we are just people of Babylon. That's who we are. And so he changes their names. Now something different happens in verse eight that I don't think that the king um, is planning on and it says this, my page is turned. In verse eight, it says, now Daniel determined that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine he drank. And so he asked permission from the chief eunuch not to defile himself. God had granted Daniel kindness and compassion from the chief eunuch. And yet he said to Daniel, I fear my Lord, the king who assigned your food and drink. What if he sees your face looking thinner than the other young men your age? You would endanger my life with the king. The eunuch is upset that Daniel will start to look like me instead of like an NFL linebacker. Like that's his fear. They want NFL linebacker. And in verse 11, it says, So Daniel said to the guard whom the chief eunuch had assigned to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then examine our appearance and the appearance of the young men who are eating the king's food, and, the, and then deal with your servants based on what you see. And he agreed with them about this and tested them for 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, they looked better and healthier than all the young men who were eating the king's food. And so the guard continued to remove their food and the wine they drank and gave them vegetables. Here's what's happening, right? We said a lot of food, a lot of drink, all this kind of stuff. I'm not gonna eat this, I'm not gonna drink this, I am gonna eat this, I am gonna drink this. Here's what's really happening. What King Nebuchadnezzar wants to do to help make them Babylonians is to change what they feast on. To make them Babylonians, he's going to first change what they feast on to make them into the image of what he wants them to be. And what we have to begin to think as we look in this passage is what is it that the world wants us to feast on? What is it that it wants us to spend our time doing in order to create something out of us? And so what is it that culture wants you to spend your, the most of your time doing, that most of your time worrying about, the most of your time having anxiety about in order that it can shape you into something? Can I, uh, I just, like, let me tell you, everything is agenda driven, especially culture. Nothing is neutral. Like culture doesn't just want you casually on social media. It never creates something that is just fun for you. You are a consumer of all things. All of us are. Like there, nobody has like your, in, in culture and driving some of these things and stirring stuff up, it does not have your best interest in mind. Like no one is sitting up in a place in a company going, I mean, we just like wanna create something that is really just gonna like help people connect. We already have those. We call it coffee shops. Go sit down at one and sit across from another human being. And even those people want your money. They just want you to spend it on coffee. Right? Like, like you, that's who we are. Like, that's what is going on. And when you begin to think about what is it that the world wants you to spend your time on and to worry about, that is who it is trying to shape you into. And so, like, one of the things, if you were to think about it, the world wants you to be as busy as you possibly can be. 
The world wants you to be exhausted. Do you want to know why? Because tired people don't stop to think. And they don't stop to rest. Because tired people lean into other things to find rescue other than Jesus oftentimes. They choose what is easiest. And so the world wants you busy. Because you are a product, the world wants you at your best, right? Like it wants you to be some like insane, fit, wise, academic monster, but not for the sake of the flourishing of the world. It'll be in order to populate schools somewhere else, that you can populate companies somewhere else, you can do a certain things, you can get to the end, like the end of the line. And you can begin to sit there and fool yourself and go, man, like the whole purpose of life. It's like, I've had, I just go to high school and then I go to college and then I get a degree and then I meet the girl or I meet the boy and then we get married, we have kids, we have like three kids, we have a white picket fence and then we have a dog, we have three dogs, we have a golden retriever and then we have a cat because we're crazy. Like, and you're like, I was just doing the same thing that everyone else is doing. If, if, and it feels like I'm not doing any of it for me. It's creating and it's crafting. Right, the, the world, in its busyness, right, here's, here's what it'll sell you on. Here's what culture will sell you on. I tell this story to parents all the time. It's my favorite story to tell because when I start it off, you'll be like, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. And then when I finish it, you'll be like, oh, like, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. The world wants to make sure that you take AP classes in like ninth grade so that way you don't end up homeless when you're 30. Man, what does like AP classes have to do with being homeless when I'm 30? Now here's the deal. I'm 30 years old and I'm still in school, so I'm not against academics. But here's what begins to sell you on. And like you can just nod if this is your experience at any point in time. Make sure that you take AP classes as quickly as you possibly can. You need to take as many as you can, even if you've never really been that successful in school. Maybe you've been like a B student, C student, uh, like high end C, low end B, average, but you need to take those AP classes because if you don't take those AP classes, then you won't go to college. And if you don't go to college, specifically a four year, probably one that's gonna drive you into like insane amounts of student debt, then you're not gonna have a successful job. If you don't have a successful job, you're never gonna be able to do well in this economy. Oh my goodness. You will probably, at the end of that, not meet somebody that you love, if you don't meet somebody that you love, then you're going to live and die and be homeless somewhere else because you didn't take an AP class in ninth grade. That's insane, but it's what most of us are having mental breakdowns for in ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade because we can't keep up. And can I just tell you something? Jesus loves you way too much for you to be having mental breakdowns. And you can take one AP class and still love Jesus and follow him. You, like, hey, academics not your thing? Okay, you need to start playing club sports at like six years old, even though you have not physically developed as a human being and your talent is like 10 years away from you and you need to travel all the time. Did you want a vacation as a kid, like spend time with family? You don't get to vacation. You're gonna be in the Metroplex and in Houston for the rest of your life playing tournaments until you're 18 years old, hoping, you're, and you're spend tens of thousands of dollars hoping that you can get a scholarship to go to the school that you could have just saved the tens of thousands of dollars that you play on sports for in order to pay for that school. So that way, when you have that scholarship, you'll be a great athlete, you'll graduate college at 22, it'll be the last time you ever play sports, and you'll have 50 years of your life in front of you thinking that the best days are between the ages of 12 and 22, and you'll be exhausted because you spent all of your physical ability doing that. Yo, that's real life. That was my life 20 years ago. It's even more so how life is now. And again, there's nothing wrong with sports and, and like academics. There's nothing wrong with being smart. Being smart's pretty good. But if it wears you down to exhaustion and beats you into nothing, that can't be the way of the Lord. The one who creates one seventh of our time at the very beginning and calls it a time of rest. But that's what culture looks like. And it'll drive you into that spaces or it'll keep you alone, bogged down on your couch and distracted watching another Netflix binge until you can't sleep again. Or glued to your phone and deciding that all of your social being and earth is all contained to an app. And those things, that's just all Babylon. Like that's just all Babylon telling you something that's not true. 
but you live there long enough, you'll begin to believe it's true. Like we will begin to believe that it's true. And so what do we do? We do what Daniel does in verse eight. And it says, but Daniel, here's what it doesn't say. It does not say that Daniel and his buddies like got in a team huddle and they were like, what do we do? They want us to eat something else. Should we? Like, should we not? Daniel on his own. You wanna step out and lead and fight in Babylon? There's a good chance you're gonna have to do it alone. And that sounds terrifying because we already found out that we don't like being lonely. We already found out that the youth pastor, like when he walks up and he's like, hey, you should go to this weekend retreat thing. And the very first question you ask is like, who else is going? Nobody likes that. But Daniel resolves to do it on his own and he steps in and says, hey, actually, what if we do it God's way? He doesn't fight. He doesn't yell at them. He doesn't comment and tell them that they're stupid. He doesn't go to the king Utica and be like, your way's dumb. He graciously steps in and goes, hey, can we try it another way? And then let's see who does better off. Here is what Daniel and his buddies know. And here's what we need to know tonight. Listen to me. If you want to maintain your identity as a follower of Jesus, just begin to do things the way that God would have you do them, that Jesus would have you do them. As you step into like every Wednesday night in your youth ministry, and as you step into church, leave every single time and go, now what do I do with this? And then begin to do it and watch life flourish. You will be doing better. Now you may not be a better athlete uh, you may not like, I'm doing the way of the things of Jesus, and all of a sudden, I'm swole. That's probably not gonna happen. But I want you to know, like, the end goal that Jesus has for you is for you to be closer to him and to flourish in the world, not just to be great at sport. Jesus wants you to be closer to him and to flourish in the world, not just to be valedictorian. The world just wants you to be valedictorian. Why? So you can look better than everybody else. And I get that. I'm an Enneagram 3. But when we step into these stories, we see that we have to begin to think, what is it that Babylon wants us to feast on? And as you're in small group tonight, think, what is it that Babylon wants you to feast on? What is it that Babylon wants you to spend all your time on, all your mind on, all your thoughts on? And then begin to maintain for yourself that you will not lose your identity in Babylon. You will not let Babylon change your name. You will always think of yourself as the name that God has given you and begin to live out the way that he is doing things. And that when you do, it will go well with you. You may have to step out and do it alone. Your best buddy may not go with you. We're gonna see tomorrow what happens when people step out and are leaders. But even as you've been in school all week and you've been thinking about it all week, what is it that Babylon wants you to feast on? And how will you fight like crazy to not lose your identity? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for tonight. God, we're thankful for your word. And even as we sit here and we think about man, what is it that Babylon wants me to feast in? For followers of Jesus, we hear that language and we go, oh man, I know that there's a better way. I have a better way. I've been given a better way. I hear about that better way. But you may be sitting here and you may be like, I don't know Jesus at all. But you have that tension in your soul that we talked about at the beginning, that things are not how they should be. And that's a real feeling. And if you're sitting there and you have that tension that, man, things are not how they should be, things are not with me how they should be, they're not in culture how they should be, I want you to know, man, Jesus has a better way. It's the way of the kingdom of heaven. And it's written all throughout these pages. And so if you don't know that Jesus and you haven't given your life to that Jesus, you have but one task tonight, and that's just to talk to your leader and say, hey, man, I wanna know the way of the kingdom of heaven. I wanna give my life to that Jesus. There's gotta be a better way. And if you are a follower of Jesus, begin to think, what is it that Babylon wants you to feast on to distract you right out of that kingdom? That you would leave this weekend maintaining your identity knowing that he is a better way. Father, be with us as we worship. 
We love you and we trust you. It's your name we pray. Amen. Y'all stand with us. We're going to sing about the one who's seated on the throne. He's seated on the throne right now, and he has people worshiping him. And we're going to join in with that tonight. Sing about how holy and how worthy he is of our worship. So let's just let him know how much we want him um, in our hearts and our lives today.
time of intercession tonight. Let's sing to the God of revival. We've seen what you can do. We've seen what you can do, oh God of wonders. Your power has no end. The things you've done before. No prison war you can break through, no mountain you can move, all oh, things are possible. There's no broken body you can raise, no soul that you can save, all oh, things are possible. The darkest night. You can light it up, you can light it up, oh God of revival, let hope arise, death is overcome, you
so cold will crumble I hear the chains hit the ground What kind of revival pour it out, pour it out Whoever's coming up after this, you can go ahead and come up. This is your cue. <laughs> there you are. Hey, y'all can be seated for just a moment. Uh, we're going we're gonna to get you to your homes and get you to your small groups here in just a little bit. I want to give some quick instruction. Am I in the way here? You're fine. I'll move it. All right. Um, we want to keep the same uh, spirit that we're in as we head to our, our small group time in the homes and, and have our breakout sessions and all that. Before we go, uh, if you are a Waco, First Baptist Waco person, uh, your youth ministers have asked that you go to these tables out here once we leave and gather, and they're going to give you some instruction. If you are a Meadowbrook person, just stay in here, and we'll talk uh, Moffat people, where, where do y'all want to go? What's the, all right, y'all follow Will. Will's, Will's got this. Okay. So, uh, with that, I just want to tell you a couple things. Um, tomorrow morning, we need to be back in here at 10 AM to worship. So that means you can't stay up all night. You need to get a little bit of sleep. Okay, I know, I know. Um, but we're gonna go ahead and break into those times in just a second, and then we'll we'll get we'll get moving. Uh, before that, remember, uh, treat the homes that you go to with greater respect than you treat your own. Okay.